Thank you very much, Kimberly. I'm very honored to be here today. I must say, I was asked to start talking about this topic of nature and mental health a few years ago, and it's pretty depressing a few years ago. Um, there really wasn't that much interest in this. There was so much opposition at so many other levels, but I really do think, uh, especially hearing Mark's talk, uh, that we're getting to the point of a tipping point. We're getting to the point where society is balance, you know, the pendulum is going to switch back towards a healthier balance with nature and technology. Uh, and I actually also wanted to say another great thing about CHEO is that if your kids do get hurt, we have an awesome emergency department. <laughs> so another one reason uh, for risky outdoor play in the uh, Eastern Ontario area. So I'm going to talk about nature and mental health from my perspective as a child psychiatrist and a bit as a parent. In terms of disclosures, within the past two years, I have nothing to declare. We'll, we'll try and I'll try and talk for 45 minutes and then we'll have time to share our experiences on best practices and getting nature into whatever setting we work at. I'm not an expert in nature at all. Uh, I'm just a psychiatrist and I'm actually relatively new to this nature and mental health thing. But I did grow up spending a lot of time outdoors because I grew up in a, a very um, strongly Italian neighborhood, actually. So picture me, this Chinese guy growing up in this Italian neighborhood. And in the evening, they were all outside, uh, uh, always offering us their wine that they had cooked uh, or offering uh, some sausages that they made on their own. And, uh, but So by the end of this session, we'll understand why nature is important, how modern society and modern policies have disrupted that connection, and talk about some ways where we can try and hopefully reconnect. And yes, those are my kids. <clears throat> so this is a typical youth that I will see. This is Dave. He's 16. He's come to see us because he's having troubles with inattention, irritability, depression. And he's struggling because he's seen other therapists for counseling and therapy. He's been on medications. And when we do that review of technology, he's spending 7.5 hours a day which is um, the last time I checked the Pew Internet resource, it was the average. But uh, now I'm hearing it's more like 10, so that's pretty scary. <clears throat> and in terms of nature time, like the average um, North American teenager, he gets less than a few minutes outside in unstructured nature time. So before we get back to Dave, let's talk about many other things. So first, the good about modern society, life is no longer poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, modern technology has benefited our lives in many ways. And today's generation of digital natives, they're going to do incredible things that we can't even imagine. But there are problems with modern society. And in my role uh, at CHEO, we are seeing an explosion in kids and adults, actually, with mental health issues. In the adult world, mental health issues are now the number one cause of disability, rather than back pain. 
and uh, Chio is seeing an explosion in demands for mental health services. So there's something wrong in our society. We've gone out of balance with nature. I remember when I was in high school, I, I saw this quote, and it's a Cree proverb, only when the last tree has died and the last river has been poisoned and the last fish has been caught will we realize we cannot eat money. And so it's interesting. We, since that time, many, many years ago when I saw that, um, since then, of course, we have all these studies proving that nature and the environment is important. But it's just sort of funny how, how we in the, you know, the Western colonizing world, we, we have to have all these studies to prove what um, our First Nations, our indigenous uh, colleagues already knew intuitively. Anyways, quick history lesson. We'll do a quick history lesson. I know everywhere we go, in our schoolyards, in our workplaces, in the public, everyone's on their smartphones. But um, it's interesting if you think about it. That's not how we've been through most of our history. Uh, modern humans appeared about 130,000 years ago. Modern society with villages and, and towns, perhaps about 6,000 years ago. And the, um, the iPad only came out in 2010, or actually the I iPad cell phones, only around 2010. So it's incredible. That's less than 10 years ago. And in that short time, these things have infected every part of our lives. So let's just talk a bit more about the past. So in the past, we lived closely with nature. We walked everywhere. Uh, we didn't call it active transportation back then, but that's essentially what people did. We spent time with people face to face. We needed other people because in order to survive, you couldn't survive on your own. We had a wide circle of family and friends. In the evenings, families would spend time together uh, because uh, there wasn't much else to do. And children walked to and from school, adults walked to and from work, and children played outside for hours and had to be nagged to come back in. So it's not surprising that we as human beings are hardwired to require nature. We don't just require nature, though we also need connections to people and activities that provide a sense of belonging, purpose, hope, and meaning but nature is one of the things we'll focus on today. How things have changed in a very short time. Nowadays we live in cities, we drive everywhere. Economic pressures mean that we actually now need two income earners to support a family, and so families actually do have less time together now. Um, this is data from the Generation Squeeze movement. I'm not, it's not actually a focus of my talk, but I, I think since one of our since there was someone out there who talked about how you both worked as parents, you had less time, uh, it's not just a perception. The economic data is there. And there's a movement called GenSqueeze.ca. It's out of the, um, originally out of the medical school in BC, actually. And their goal is to try and change social policies so that we have more time together as families. Even when we are at home, though, families are disconnected often due to our technology and separate activities. And the average teen apparently spends four to seven minutes outside in unstructured play versus uh, over 7.5 hours a day in front of a recreational screen. We also don't get enough sleep in modern society, so our average teen is sleep deprived, getting only seven hours a day when they need at least nine and a half on average. And of course, we don't spend out side time anymore. So modern society has disconnected us from those things that we need. Things that we need such as nature, deep connections, and it's replaced it with technology and superficial connections. And so uh, there's been a concept called nature deficit disorder where uh, Richard Louvre described we don't get enough time and he called it a disorder to try and bring attention to this issue. Okay, so I'll try and skip through these parts faster because I know Mark probably talked about a lot of this. So there is a lot of evidence that nature is important for our physical and mental health. Uh, how much time? It depends on which studies you look at. Some studies, such as one by Shanahan in the public health literature, said that you only need 30 minutes or more a week to start to see benefits. Naturally, more is better. But it's fascinating that only 30 minutes a week you can actually see differences on a population level. And some of the um, 
population level benefits from that study were that if everyone got out at least 30 minutes or more per week, the population prevalence of depression would come down by 7%. In terms of the eyesight data, the ophthalmology or sorry, optometry or ophthalmological evidence, it's been shown that if kids can get at least, uh, actually is it in this slide? Well, I'll say it, the magic number was 10 hours a week to improve our eye health over the population. <clears throat> Studies show that safe urban parks are good for your mental health. Nature is better for your brain. It improves symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Walking in a park any time of year helps your attention and memory. Uh, even if you can't get real nature, apparently, even looking at a picture of nature helps you feel better. And here's a very fascinating one. Climbing a tree improves our cognitive skills, including our working memory, by 50%. So it's fascinating. I guess it makes sense if we think about it. We're, we're all cousins of apes. <clears throat> For those of us, uh, how many of us work in offices most of the day? Yeah, most of us. How many of you are lucky enough to get to work outside? Oh, well, that's awesome. Uh, so this is a personal pet peeve of mine because I work at Chio, and I'm lucky. I have a window with an office, but half of my colleagues actually have windowless offices. And studies actually show that if we had natural elements and sunlight in our offices, it would improve our mood job satisfaction, as well as our organizational commitment, our commitment to the organization. Of course, this is common sense, right? But of course, someone had to do a study because without a study, our policy makers and leaders don't follow through with anything. Uh, and of course, the converse is true that in offices where there is a lack of sunlight or natural elements, you have depressed mood, anxiety, you're not committed to the organization, and you're less satisfied with your work. So. Uh, the conclusion of that study was that nature investments is actually a very good business decision. I find it very fascinating that if we look at um, the literature on best practices and nature design, do you know which type of company is most likely to have these best practices? Yeah, Google, I heard someone say. It's our tech companies. Fascinating, isn't it? The ones which make this digital cocaine for us are actually the ones most likely to know that their employees need nature. Uh, it, it's fascinating. At CHEO, we're going to have this new building. Those of us who actually work there really want to have inner courtyards with nature, but we'll see. <clears throat> so I know many of us here are, uh, many of you here are from public health, so it's awesome. Uh, there's a lot of data that nature is important for mental health, and even the um, Toronto Public Health Department has a whole position paper on why nature matters to health. When I grew up, it was easy to get outside. My mom could just let us go outside because all the other kids were outside. Uh, and then so, and, and we've reached a tipping point where there's not that critical mass of kids outside anymore. And as Mark said, if, if there's no, nobody outside, then how, you know, how do you, as an individual parent, want to get your kids outside? You, it's sort of like you have to go out on a limb to get outside. So I guess my point is, is that um, there actually is interest from Ottawa Public Health because I met someone a few years ago wondering about how on a community level or a street level we could get people outside again. So if those of you in public health know who this person was, we could maybe help organize you know, grassroots campaigns to get our kids outside. <clears throat> So I think this has been alluded to. Why is it so hard to get our kids outside? So we've talked about this. The whole title of this thing is From Screen Time to Green Time. It's the screens, which are one factor that are getting us indoors. So as a psychiatrist, I'm always fascinated. Why is it that screens are so addictive? Part of it is because we're hunter-gatherers, really. Our brains are wired for hunter hunting and gathering. They're wired for survival. And so we seek out things which give dopamine and adrenaline. We used to get this from hunting and reproduction. And that helps us explain why we love our Hollywood movies with sex and violence. But before screens 
How did kids get their dopamine and adrenaline? They went outside. And interestingly enough, when you go outside as well, you are spending face-to-face -face time with people. And that also gives your brain oxytocin. <clears throat> Here's the challenge. Modern electronic screens hack our brains by giving us easy dopamine. We can sit on a chair and without any effort looking at that screen, it gives us easy dopamine. So why would you want to go outside from a brain perspective? Our brains are wired to want to get the most benefit with the least effort. Why put in that effort if you can just get your dopamine sitting on a couch? And so the tech companies had figured this out. Dr. Trombley is a good psychologist. He uses his powers for good. But there are evil psychologists that work with those companies in order to help design things to be addictive. And so our technology companies have figured out how to make things addictive. Uh, it's funny, even TV, they've managed how to make that addictive. When I was a kid, you really couldn't watch more than an hour or two of TV because it really got boring after a while. But now, thanks to Netflix, they've figured out how to make people binge on that stuff. So from a mental health perspective, the problem if we use too much technology is that it gets our brain wired. Too much dopamine and too much adrenaline from screens uh, has been described as creating what we call excess electronic screen syndrome. So it's like turning on your body's alarm. And that helps us understand why kids may say they want to use that screen because it calms them down. But after 30 minutes, an hour or two, they're actually not really calm. It's not restorative. My talk is actually not about screen detox, which is how to get kids off screens. But I know, statistically speaking, just being in a room like this, I always get parents come to me after a talk asking how they can get their kids off or their partners off. So I will just mention that if you're interested to learn more about how to get your kids off the tech, there's an excellent book called Reset Your Child's Brain by Virginia Dunkley. So what are some recommendations that, as a mental health professional, I would make for promoting nature and preventing tech addiction? First, uh, I, I like to know how much time, because as Mark alluded to, in healthcare, we're starting to prescribe nature. And uh, it's easier to prescribe something if we can have a dose. So it's fascinating. It depends who you ask. So as I said earlier, Shanahan's work suggests at least 30 minutes a week. Um, our friends in Finland from the Natural Resources Institute recommend at least five hours a month for mental health. That's really not that much. That's like one hour a week. Um, the eye um, studies at the moment seem to be the strongest evidence for what we, what's the most. Uh, so they, the eyesight studies recommend at least 10 hours a week so that our kids don't get myopia. And that works out to like 1.5 hours a day. Uh, as a parent, in my perfect world, of course, kids would get two hours a day outside at school, during the school hours, and then I don't have to work at it. Uh, that's just me as a parent. And Mark's work on the position statement says at least one hour of physical activity, ideally outside, right? And so. I know I asked Mark earlier how much time I was, I had a fantasy, maybe there's some late breaking thing he read last night, but um, I really like the work Mark is doing because I look forward to the next version of that uh, statement where hopefully we'll have some hours on how much outdoor time that should be. At my kids' first school, they had a stipulation for the, 40, you know, the Ministry of Ed stipulates 45 minutes of daily physical activity. So you're lucky if your school follows that. You're even luckier if your school actually gets outdoors. So as health professionals, increasingly, we're trying to prescribe nature. So one and a half hours a day outside, no subs, no substitutions. That's what that means. So I know some of you are healthcare providers. So, uh, and those of you who aren't, you're still probably seeing a lot of kids with mental health issues. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some of what we're trying to do in the mental health area to try and help kids using the power of nature. So it turns out there's actually this term, ecotherapy, that's been around for quite a long time in, uh, in England, in Europe. 
actually I hadn't heard about this at all when I did my residency training. Ecotherapy is the use of treatment programs to improve nature, uh, sorry, to improve mental or physical well-being through nature. It's also got similar terms such as green exercise, green care, green therapy, vitamin you know, um, G, horticultural therapy. So there's different elements and you'll recognize some of this uh, in many of our programs as well. So one type of ecotherapy is what we call adventure therapy. This is fairly strenuous physical activities in a group plus some psychological intervention like rafting, rock climbing, walking on volcanic rocks, I guess, uh, stuff to build confidence and trust. Another type of ecotherapy intervention is using animals. And so being in places such as a farm to have contact with animals, feeding, petting animals. And then there's actually animal assisted therapy, which is using, using actual animals in a formal therapy. So at CHEO, we have people that come uh, to do animal assisted therapy with dogs. There's care farming, and in some places, uh, people have opportunities to look after farm animals. There's ecotherapy, where a trained ecotherapist leads people in outdoor activities. There's green exercise therapy, which is basically doing physical activity outside, like walking and running and cycling, run by a leader. Nature arts and crafts, which is doing crafts outside. Horticultural therapy, which is gardening or growing food outside, guided by a tutor. And then there's wilderness therapy. And there are other interventions as well. We don't have very much of this in our mental health programs right now, unfortunately, but this is something hopefully will grow. But I will give you some examples of how it's used increasingly in Canada. In Eastern Ontario, if you're in the Cataraqui area, there actually is a forest therapy program. So uh, with a forest guide, you walk in nature one to three hours. And it's a mindfulness activity. It's to be one with nature. It's not so much about the physical strenuousness of it because you're only walking up, up to about 1K or so. The Canadian Mental Health Association has mood walks. And it's an initiative where you go on walks outdoors. So if you're in Scarborough, then you walk in the Rouge Valley. And they're guided by a social worker, uh, guides from Parks Canada. There's usually 10 guided hikes. And this is what youth say about these programs. I felt super safe. I didn't feel I was a patient. I wasn't thinking about my mental health or other issues. There's the mindfulness part of it. What we talked about in nature helped us to heal. We left our negativity in the forest. So it's interesting for me as a mental health professional when I think about it, how, how for millennia human beings probably benefited from these mental health interventions. We didn't even call it that at the time. Now we've taken that away and now of course our mental health services are overflowing. Here's a little shout out to YouthNet. Anyone from YouthNet here? No, okay. Well, they're a program at CHEO, it's a mental health program and it's actually a very strongly youth-led initiative. And it's fascinating because they're the main program at CHEO that does any sort of nature intervention. So YouthNet actually has programs for youth, such as winter wellness, where they do physical activities such as snowboarding. They have a rooted program in the summer where people do gardening, they grow a vegetable garden, they explore trails around Gatineau. So how can we get more nature into our lives? Here's some suggestions as, um, as an individual. So if you're an individual, you can bring nature into your environment. So get plants for your home. Listen to nature sounds or open the window and listen to nature. And each of these is on a scale of increasing uh, uh, work. <clears throat> your next level is at home. Have a growing space indoors or outdoors so you can grow some plants. We have community gardens in Ottawa or garden outside. The next level would be getting a dog, going for walks outside, bird watching. The next level is walking or biking to work. Build a 10 minute walk into your daily routine. 
So park farther away, so you have to walk 10 minutes extra to get to work. And we'll talk more about this, but this is the part where we need, at all of, with all of these interventions, we need higher levels to make it easier as well, if we're going to change things on a population level. So I think it's nice to say you have to go biking and try bike to work, but of course it's easier if we have protected bike lanes where you, um, you're not biking right beside a tractor trailer. And worse comes to worse, even if we can't get our kids off the technology, you can still do the technology outside and get some benefits from being outside. Suggestions for parents. So uh, this is a funny one. This, this is my kid when he was, I guess, just starting to crawl. And we, ha we have a dog uh, with a doggy door. And it was very fascinating. In the beginning, we would try and lock the door so he couldn't get out. Uh, and then, of course, we just said, you know, what the hell? <laughs> Even if he rolls down the steps, he's not going to kill himself. Chio's just a few minutes away. Uh, so it is fascinating how our kids are wired to want nature. And as long as we don't stamp that out of them, they can get outside. Of course, as in my work with parents, it's not as simple as just saying, you know, kick your kids outside. First, you have to have a connection with them. So the first thing, if a parent doesn't have that connection, you have to build your connection. As a parent, you have to listen, empathize, validate, accept your children. If you're lucky enough to live close enough to your school, which was easier a generation ago because we had more schools and they were closer to your home, uh, try and walk or bike with your kids to school. Or on the weekends, have family board night rather than board game night rather than movie night. Technology is a big issue, and that's one of the big barriers that I see when I work with families and we're trying to get them outside. So it's interesting. Many families are just so busy, they don't actually set limits on technology. But there are guidelines. Try and set limits around technology. Try and have maximal one to two hours a day of recreational screen time for school-age kids, 6 to 12. Um, try and limit time during dinner. Have a device bowl where people can put their devices into when they get in. Promote outdoor play, as Mark has said earlier. And Mark, he probably talked about natural play spaces, right? So uh, did he? No? OK, good. I'm glad. Thank you for not talking about that. So many of us in the 70s or 80s, we grew up with structures like this. But this is actually not a natural play space. And kids are actually apparently more likely to get hurt on, on this type of plastic or metal structure. So for, for those in the field of designing outdoor places, <clears throat> there's a movement to design natural play spaces. So it's using natural environmental features like boulders for kids to climb, streams to dim, uh, logs to practice balancing. When I work with parents, many of them Forget everything I say, but this is one thing they remember. I tell them that Steve Jobs was actually a low-tech parent. He didn't even let his own kids have an iPad when they came out. As Steve says, our kids actually haven't used the iPad. We limit how much tech our kids have. At the dinner ta table, we talk about books and history. It's fascinating, but many people in Silicon Valley are like this. Uh, I think it's funny, it's sort of like, you know, those people in the drug cartels that sell the cocaine, they actually don't let their own kids use the cocaine, but it's the same thing. Uh, anyone, I know there's some educators here, and uh, I think one of our childcare colleagues was, you were telling us about some of the barriers you have. So, what I find fascinating about Silicon Valley is that in the education area, there's a very famous Waldorf school that a lot of Silicon Valley execs send them to. So for those of you who don't know, a Waldorf philosophy is a philosophy uh, based on nature-focused education, and it's very big in Europe, in Scandinavia, and Germany. They have no computers in the classroom until grade six to eight. Unlike many of our schools now, where from kindergarten, kids are using iPads. And they prioritize learning with natural ways. 
They prioritize knitting, gardening, nature walks, and outdoor classrooms. So in a typical Waldorf school, kids may spend several hours a day outside. I will say that in Ottawa, we have uh, one Waldorf school at the French Public Board, Tri de Bois. We also have a Finnish model-inspired nature school under the Catholic Board, um, Ecole Catholique Point Ca. And so it's fascinating that if you're francophone and, and can send your kids to these publicly funded things, that's great. I'm not actually yet aware of any publicly funded English schools uh, of this type. Anyone aware? No, yeah. So there are four, there's uh, private schools, like the four schools, but it's private. Other ways to get nature as a parent are sign your kids up for those things like Scouts Canada, Girl Guides, 4-H, Army Cadets. Army Cadets is great. When you're old enough, they'll just drop you in the middle of nature, leave you there for 48 hours. <clears throat> So my suggestions for those of you in the education field is hopefully we can get this up to a ministry of education level and then you'll get that support. As someone said earlier, it's really hard to try and get your kids outside when your school board is asking you to fill out 12 forms or have to worry about the EQA O's or this or that. But there are established green philosophies for education out there. We just need to follow them. Oh, here's the Ottawa-based one. Yeah, there's Chi de Bois, uh, Nouvelle École Catholique, and Four School. So a lot of what we need to do as well, I think, needs to happen from changing things top-down. It's We need a grassroots movement, yes, but we also need top-down changes. Are there any CEOs here, <laughs> managers? No, actually that's surprising. Or maybe they're too embarrassed to say yes. So um, we need our workplaces to design nature so it's there. It's nice to say go outside for lunch hour. But listen, if you're going to be there at your workplace for eight hours a day, we need to have more nature in our spaces. There's a lot of policy papers by the Back to Nature Network on how we can get more nature into um, learning and other areas. I'm glad that Ottawa Public Health is here. Do we have any people from uh, urban planning here? No, okay, maybe another year they'll come. But we need architects to build nature elements into our buildings. It's funny here, right? Uh, Mark was joking, maybe we should, if only we could get outside, outdoors. We, we live in this awesome country, yet so much of our buildings have no nature, you know? Uh, a personal pet peeve of mine is, if you're a parent and you try and get your kids into the sports, like hockey, martial arts, is it, it's funny that hockey arenas are indoors. Most martial arts clubs are indoors. For me as a parent, I really wish we could have more of a movement to get more either I know it's not going to happen. You know, my fantasy would be, of course, retractable sunroofs for, um, for, for the gymnastics uh, place where my kid is. But we need to get more ways of getting light into our structures. It's not impossible because in Europe they have more green design. Anyone go up, grow up in Germany? Here, yes. Did you go to school in Germany? For four years. Yes. So my German friends tell me that in Deutschland, they had the Licht inspector, the light inspector come every year to their school. The light inspector would do lighting measurements and that was to make sure not only were the kids getting natural light, but it had to be enough natural light. And I have a friend who works in um, the American Embassy. Because he's German, but he works at the American Embassy, he actually has a right to have an office with a window. It's funny because his American coworkers, they have no right to a window. <laughs> uh, they don't even get, you know, decent parental leave. But um, that's another issue. But it's fascinating that the German employee, because he's a German national, he has more right to light than that poor American colleague. So it's possible, but we need a revolution at a higher level. It has to be in our building code and our health and safety regulations or something. 
course, I look at Mark because Mark's really good at these higher level interventions. So as has probably been said, nature is probably one of the most cost effective public health interventions you can possibly have. As a biker, um, I know all the recommendations are bike to work, but you know, I feel much safer <laughs> if, if I'm not biking right beside a tractor trailer. So I love Europe because they have protected bike lanes, or at least they're a different color. Those of us um, who have kids know that there's a growing movement for active school transport. So that's getting our kids to walk to school. And there's many health benefits from that. And it turns out that in communities which can actually engineer more active transport, so more people are biking or walking, it actually benefits local businesses more. People on bikes and pedestrians spend more money in a downtown core, in a, in a market area, than people in cars. There are economic factors which I do think make it harder for parents to have time with their families. So there is a movement called the Gen Squeeze movement that is trying to shift government spending so it makes it easier for families. I also think just like we've legislated tobacco because it's so addictive, we need to move towards legislating technology. There should not be baby apps on the app store. You know, Mark knows babies shouldn't have apps. But if you're that sleep deprived parent in a low income area and you just happen to innocently wander onto the Android store or the Apple store and it says baby app, you, you get seduced. You don't know the evidence. So we need regulations so that people can make better decisions. And for those of us who are still struggling, uh, ask your indigenous friends, grandparents, Mennonite, Amish friends, Jewish Orthodox friends. They have great tips on how to get nature back into your life. So I'll end off by mentioning a few organizations that are doing this work already. Back to Nature Network, Kid Active, Child and Nature Alliance. Do we have any of these people in the room, by the way? You know, some, oh, great. Who, I've met you before, right? Yeah. Yes. Good to see you today. Of course, you were the one leading the, uh, you know, the active activity. So getting back to Dave, um, we help Dave by reconnecting him and his mom to nature. First though, we have to help mom with listening better so that he actually wants to be with her. Luckily, they have a dog so that they start walking the dog after dinner. Then they start weekend nature hikes like they used to. Once they're connected, then mom starts to pull back on the technology. And so then he's happy again. So one of my uh, closing notes is that we need to design our communities so that nature is just part of what we do in our day to day. I don't think it should be go outside during lunch hour to get nature. It should be in our spaces everywhere. <clears throat> As a plug for um, CHEO, we actually have a website, eMentalHealth.ca. We have some more information about nature and technology, in case you're interested. These are for parents to help them get more nature and less technology. Here's some references that I used, and I will end off on this video. When you were a kid, what did you do for fun? So we go blueberry picking, for instance. Uh, just, that's so cute. <laughs> but it was true. We grew watermelons, um, plantains. I found an old sign which was big enough for me to sit on and made a great toboggan. It was very slick, very fast. <laughs> I had a few fish in my basket and I looked up on this bluff and here's this black bear sitting there watching me. If he starts chasing me, I'm going to keep throwing the fish out of my basket until he's gorged and he won't, and he won't bother me. And what did you like to do for fun? You, you know, you go door to door, get a group of kids, and you play uh, lots of games, uh, hide and seek, just going out to the field and playing baseball. And we build these massive forts, you know, the kind that you can actually sit in and, and, and play in, you know, with, with our friends, and it was just really wonderful. So what do you like to do for fun? Video games, definitely. 
I like to go on my phone, text, send email. email. My favorite thing to do in the world is definitely watching videos and playing video games. Those take up so much of my time. Three hours, or t three to four hours a day. Same. Five hours straight. Just last week, I watched 23 episodes of a TV series in less than four days. I forget. I'm in a house, I have parents, I have a sister, I have a dog, I just think I'm in the video game, I completely get lost. I would die if I don't have my tablet. Whenever I feel upset, I'd play video games and I'd feel normal. It's really wonderful. When your daughters grow up, your great-great-grandkids, what do you think will happen if this trend continues? It's scary to think that they'll never have to leave the house. Cindy grew up uh, doing a lot of the things that I did and, and enjoyed, and I see what uh, my grandsons are doing today, and it's, uh, it's mind-boggling. By the time they have kids, it's gonna be a really different environment. I actually feel a little sad because I feel like he's missing out on what's out there mm. in the beautiful world. special connection with nature. I think it's innate in all children, but needs to be nurtured. That was a disclaimer, it is a a uh, commercial from Nature Valley, but we won't hold that against them. So that ends my talk. Uh, I actually did want to say a final thing. There would have been a slide of my kids. Uh, my daughter with a broken arm, actually. So this is, uh, Mark will find this humorous because my daughter has broken her arm. She sprained her ankle. All these injuries happen when she's playing indoors. Uh, it's never happened while she's playing outside. So very interesting. Uh, I should probably give you that data and then you can add it to your study. <laughs> so thank you very much everyone for coming today. We're here because we all feel the same way. We feel we need to help get our whole society from screens onto green time. So I'm really glad that you're all here so that we can work together on this most important work. Thank you. My name is Amy and I am a kindergarten educator with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. Oh, wonderful. Um, very, very blessed. Our school is working on creating in the kindergarten yard a huge outdoor learning classroom and, and uh, learning spaces for not just the kinders but for all of our students that we'll use. Um, and I have been asked to be sitting on the, the panel with the uh, parent council and the principals and things. Now you had mentioned about the nature um, play space. Now with the board and with a lot of agencies they tend to be going with the, the plastic and the metal and those types of things. And that seems to be where they're going. So is there a, a place where can I find <coughs> resources that would back up what you were saying about you know putting nature back in, putting the nature back in. One of the challenges we had was we had logs in our yard in a circle and the children would would step on them and walk on them and play. And That's awesome. We had three children that fell and got hurt and then they wanted to take them all out of our yard. So it took us quite a few meetings to get them put back into the yard. But where would I be able to find some resources and find some of the statistics she spoke of right. to support the natural play stuff in our classrooms rather than all the plastic and metal? Right. So um, I'm really glad we have the expertise. I'll start and then I'll turn to my colleagues. So I think often educators listen to other educators. So I would consider having your educators contact your friends at the um, Conseil des Ecoles, the public, the, the you know the the French um, public wall, yeah. okay? because they have tree de bois, and in the tree de bois play area they have logs, 
and yes. the kids run on the logs and the logs roll and then you get a whole bunch of kids together will be carrying the logs around mm -hmm. and somehow at Tri de Bois they don't have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. So maybe principal to principal they could have a talk. Okay. Now, uh, and then I know they also have their educational literature on, on, on why they've chosen that. Okay. Uh, and so at Tri de Bois they have a natural play space. And then I know that Kid Active, right? You're with Kid Active? Yeah. You, this is your work, right? You work with... Education. Yeah, there's an amazing document for, like, for early years called The Seven Seas that's done by a landscape architect professor at a UBC. And so what was that Seven called? Seven Seas. But it gives you a, a, a lot of context as to why designing with nature in mind is so beneficial okay. to the early years. And there's an abundance of other resources. The OCDSB uh, works with the Child and Nature Alliance. Um, so even connecting with your board as to the work they're already doing to promote nature-based play. Um, and Evergreen, OCDSB also works with Evergreen really closely. Um, so there are resources right within your administrative building to support natural play spaces. And it's, it's sad because they're not being shared with all of the schools. Because quite often some of the decision making is done at a school level. Um, so a lot of it's fear induced or fear um, focused decision making. And it's subjective. So it's not based on the evidence. It's not based on maybe work that's being done higher up. Or even on work that's being done by amazing practitioners within the school board. So there is amazing work being done by LCDSB. Um, just reaching out and finding it. Thank you. So that's wonderful. And then, so I'm grateful to pioneers such as you, who are local champions. And then hopefully the next level is that one day, all this knowledge will hopefully be what teachers are taught as part of their curriculum in teaching school, uh, or what we're taught in our medical school curriculums. So hopefully a generation from now, hopefully these will be standard practice. Generation. Oh, actually, Mark, uh, there was a question about um, how they were worried about the risk from people falling. Did you have a comment on how we might help her school board mitigate that? Yeah, I know, but in the, um, in the manuscript that substantiates the position statement, um, we have written a little bit about that, and, and this allegiance to, and even infatuation with, the CSA standards, which are the ones that promote plastic playgrounds and, and so on. Um, we have some statements in there that might be of some use to you. Uh, and it's okay to challenge that too, just because it says CSA, uh, Canadian Standards Association, which is not a licensing group, it's not a regulation, it's not anything, it's just a, um, a recommendation from a group of people, some of whom happen to be in the plastic playground business actually, uh, which is interesting. If, if uh, Michael or I ever did stuff like this, we would, we would certainly be called on conflict of interest, but they don't seem to be. So, so there is some pushback. And the other thing I'd recommend too is just Google uh, Adventure Playground Setup Canada or something like that, and go to the sites of companies that do this. I'm sure they're going to have anecdotes and information as well, substantiating uh, the, 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 the outdoor, the natural playgrounds. And one of our main statements is the uh, position statement is that kids like it more. That's what the research shows. Uh, it's, it's much more interesting and useful across a wider age, uh, age range as well. Uh, similar to the French schools, you know, you can contact the uh, Forest and Nature School uh, out in uh, Corkstown Road as well for information. If you go there, that's all there is out there. That's all the kids have. Thank you, Mark. My name is Lindsay. I'm from the Ottawa Uni Children's Center. I'm an after-school program coordinator. Um, I work among a staff team. This is one of my teammates. Um, my question is in regards to like the addiction to technology. So when um, children who've experienced trauma and lack in kind of making those social connections with peers to play outside, um, to get that dopamine and adrenaline hit from others who are addicted to like their games that give them that sense of belonging, that sense of like wellness to them. Like, how do you go about breaking the addiction that they've created, or like the substitute? Like, how do you? Because like, if someone's going through treatment, 
um, they're having assisted support, and it's recognized as an addiction, yet the screens are providing like a very similar thing, especially those who've experienced trauma, and their circuit pathways are different in how they respond. Yes, so that's a complicated question. <laughs> If I think what's contributed to some of the issues that your kids have, part of it's colonialism, right? part of it's poverty, part of it's um, stuff that has happened at a higher level. If I were to answer you, your question as a clinician, what would I do if I were to see a family in this type of position? I guess I would recommend that you're at the Ottawa Inuit um, Children's Centre, it's a daycare, right? Um, no. So I work with children 6 to 13. Okay. Um, and they get transportation provided to our program. We have snack, we feed them dinner, and then at the end of the night, after doing a bunch of fun stuff, they go home with the transportation company back okay. to their family. So it's an evening program mm -hmm. that these kids attend. And it's, a, it's I guess, a, a therapeutic type place, a safe space for them to be in. And I guess your challenge is that you're finding many kids are addicted to technology. Um, it's not program. so much like in my specific position now because we've made like a no technology rule and it's not right. so much that, but in other positions that I've had when I've provided like one on su one support in a school, um, lots of the children who, who I was working with there and like some of my colleagues are working with people in this, like going to schools and trying to help um, students in that sense. And it's more of like when you're working one on one and then you've got this kid who's like, oh, well, like, I need this. Right. You're working with them one-on-one -on -one and you're finding they're addicted to technology. Yeah. So we, we get these kids all the time at SHIELD. And so our usually, our, if we're working at the family level, our approach is to try and connect with the parents and form that connection with parents. We try and have them, uh, you know, using motivational interviewing strategies, we try and agree on a common goal first. Uh, we don't jump in and say you should to put away the screen time. We first build on that relationship, the common goal. But the common goal that most parents do have is they want what's best for their children's development. And then hopefully if they can agree on that, then we'll ask them, what do you think is best for your kid? Interestingly enough, most parents will eventually acknowledge that their kids probably use too much screen time. And then once we have that connection, then we work on, well, I'm glad we can agree that you want your kids to develop the best and Glad you agree, maybe you have too much screen time. What do you think we could do next? And then, so we go step by step there. Um, so in that approach, it's connecting first with the parents and then helping them connect with their kid and set the limits. I don't, does that answer your question or did you? Um, was it kind nice? of, it kind of does. I feel like it is a bigger question that has a lot more behind it. Um, and I think that having that approach makes sense, like kind of coming together as a common goal. And even like you can do that one-on-one -on -one with the kids as well. Because mm -hmm. um, we're not necessarily involved with the parents personally after school. It's more of our other staff team, but we like I can offer that advice to them as well. Yeah. So at CHIO, we have this issue so common now that in our parenting groups, <coughs> there's dedicated time within our parenting groups to the dangers of screens. And, uh, and then I think uh, we have to get this, uh, this up to a higher level so that parents get this education earlier, right? It's, it's, um, and so actually I'll just sort out there, Ottawa Public Health, I'm sure you, know, you do a lot of education on early years parenting. Do we have anyone involved in Ottawa Public Health who's doing that type of parenting education or stuff? No. Okay, I'm sure someone else. Very <laughs> What, what I just found so funny of being a parent is that you, you get all this stuff on the delivery, right? There's all this hours preparing you for the delivery, but there's actually very little we were taught about uh, what happens next after the delivery. So anyway, <laughs> there you go. Uh, another question I see. Uh, I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm Darwin McLean. I just started fairly recently as the youth program director at Carp Eagle Bridget, or sorry, Carp Bridge Eagle Wellness Center in Carp where we also have a course school for the preschool and course therapy that we just did. Amazing. <laughs> well, we didn't do it. Somebody did the training, but we facilitated it. So it was fun. 
kind of uh, nice to see that on your slides. Yeah, I'm going to add you guys for, the, for my next version of this presentation. Okay, great. So well, I have an exhibit over next door. I'm really happy to be at Carbridge and helping to get kids outside because I so believe in it passionately. And um, I just, this this whole, I, I'm so happy to be here at the presentation and to get some great pointers from you, Mark, as well. Um, but that's mostly not why I'm standing here. Um, I just wanted to add a couple points. I also spearheaded getting a playground at my children's school. We did go with the metal and the plastic in the end, but we did try to go for bean and stock that's in Toronto and does um, construct them here. They did the Montessori school. But we, uh, and we did it because we found they actually encompass or interest more kids of all abilities as well. That was one of our key points to do that. Um, versus it tends to be the more athletic kids that go on the other structures. Um, but it was harder to get grants, like because you couldn't provide specifics sometimes because it's a custom um, deal, like you pay 7500 or at least then, and then they do a custom plan for you. So it was harder that, from that aspect, but we thought it was great and we wanted to pursue it. But in the end, we went with a structure that has as many moving parts on it for kids to get them as active and increase their agility and things like that. Um, but I want to mention Halton's uh, public or Catholic school board in Toronto was at that point putting in a whole bunch of uh, bean and stock playgrounds, natural playgrounds. So maybe you can get some feedback on that. And I'd be happy to help with any of that. <laughs> um, but uh, what I um, also met, wanted to mention beside the, besides the forest retreat is that uh, there was a couple of references to the ADHD. We have a workshop coming up on the 26th um, because of the problems and issues that youth are dealing with. Um, but I also wanted to ask you regarding the screen time because even though I get my kids outside, I find it a challenge. Um, and I've thought about reverting back to two days without screen time. Is, is that something you employ or is it better to yeah. Cut down the screen time per day, or I, I think some parents actually would like to just not have a fight on certain days and say no screens on Mondays and Wednesdays. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I didn't get into that, but I would agree that I don't have any studies to back this up. But in my work with families, I'll say the parents that have no recreational screens on weekdays or school days, mm -hmm. and then they give screen time as a treat on weekends, it's easier to enforce that. Do you think it's realistic to often do it like Monday to Friday? Mm -hmm. I've heard of it and I, I just have a hard time thinking of doing that. I, I think uh, conceptually we can say, you know what, it's, it's a weekday, it's a school mm -hmm. day, no screens on school days, and if the parents can get that early enough into the kids, I, I, I like that idea because mm -hmm. it gives five days of detox from a recreational screen. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekend, they can, they can use as much as they want, really they're not going to get as addictive uh, because they're only using it for two, you know, two days on the weekend. And then once the weekday goes again, it's recreational screen time. Uh, and I will say, yes, uh, schools all need kids nowadays, uh, to, well, the non-Waldorf, non-nature-based schools do uh, have kids using their Chromebooks or Google Docs and this and that. But we're not as worried about that from an addiction point of view because when you're writing that science assignment with your classmates, it doesn't give you a dopamine rush. Um, so it's, not now, it's not good from a myopia perspective, but you know I'm a brain guy, so I, it's not addictive. Um, where so so many families prefer it's, uh, to use the no recreational screen time during weekdays. There are some families which try and do those, you know, follow the guidelines, which are one to two hours max for school age kids, but then. Oftentimes, they have these horrible fights when the two hours is up. So, you know, it's really hard to take that cocaine away from them, um, so even with the timer, even with the written schedule. So, that's my opinion on that. It'd be great. One day, someone can hopefully do a study. I know there are a lot of students in the room, right? If you can do a study, saying best practices for technology restriction and limit setting, that would be great. Thank you so much, everyone.